This is a lecture on the Book of Lamentations, which is a lament over the fall of Jerusalem. My name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle. First of all, the authorship of Lamentations. The author of Lamentations is unknown. The book itself is anonymous. Jewish tradition ascribes it to Jeremiah. The early Greek translation, the Septuagint, reads that it was Jeremiah who sat weeping in the first verse. Septuagint also places the book with Jeremiah after the apocryphal book of Baruch. Jeremiah certainly lived through the fall of Jerusalem and was a man of much emotion and compassion, so he would be well qualified to be the author of Lamentations. We also know that Jeremiah wrote other Lamentations, as mentioned in 2 Chronicles 35-25. On the other hand, nothing in the Hebrew text connects the book to Jeremiah. So my conclusion is Jeremiah's authorship is certainly possible, maybe even probable, but it's something less than certain. There could have been somebody else who lived through the destruction of Jerusalem, another prophet, that could have composed the book. The date of Lamentations is shortly after 586 BC, the year that Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem. And it was obviously pretty close to these events because the memories of it was still very raw. On the other hand, it has to be written well before 539 BC when Cyrus allowed the Jews to return from Babylonian exile to begin rebuilding Jerusalem. The Book of Lamentation consists of five carefully structured poems the first four of which are alphabetic acrostics, that is, in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, each verse begins with a consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is why there's 22 verses, since there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The only one that's different is chapter 3, where it does it in triplicate. The first three verses are the first letter, Aleph, the next three verses, the next letter bet, all the way through the 22 letters of the alphabet, all the way to Tav. And thus you have 66 verses in chapter 3. The only one that isn't an acrostic is chapter 5. The whole book is unified by the common theme of lament over the destruction of Jerusalem. Scholars have noticed a style in the poems of chapters 1 through 4, which they have labeled the dirge style. The Hebrew word for that is kina. It has an unusual pattern with a longer line of poetry followed by a short line of poetry, kind of a 3-2 meter. Three words followed by two words, three words followed by two words, and so on and so forth. And this is arguably a dirge style, which you would use when you were mourning for the dead. And thus, rather than parallelism, there's an intentional unbalanced line in these poems. And again, this is described by scholars as kina or dirge style. The structure of Lamentations is chiastic. It begins with a poem about the present anguish of Zion. That's A. But then chapter 5 is a poem praying for the future hope for Zion, present and future. Then B and B prime, poem 2, is wrath because God has become their enemy. Uh, B prime, chapter 4, is wrath because of the sin of the people. Both of those are connected. And then in the middle you have poem 3 about the compassion of God. Where you have a chiastic structure, typically it's the item in the middle of the structure that's the most important. And so the most important thing here would be that middle poem about the compassion of God. So let's read a few verses from each chapter. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. She has become like a widow 
who was once great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces, has become a forced laborer. She weeps bitterly in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. She has none to comfort her among all her lovers. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile under affliction and under harsh servitude. She dwells among the nations, but she has found no rest. All her pursuers have overtaken her in the midst of distress. The roads of Zion are in mourning because no one comes to the appointed feast. Her gates are desolate. Her priests are groaning, her virgins are afflicted, she herself is bitter. Her adversaries have become her masters, her enemies prosper. For the Lord has caused her grief because of the multitude of her transgressions. Her little ones have gone away as captives before the adversary. At the end of chapter 1, personified Zion speaks. Personified Zion says, Is it nothing to all you who pass this way? Look and see if there is any pain like my pain, which was severely dealt out to me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Chapter 2 is going to argue that the wrath is because God has become their enemy. Verse 5, The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has destroyed its strongholds and multiplied in the daughter of Judah, mourning and moaning. A solution, though, is to cry to the Lord. Verse 18, their heart cried out to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let your tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief. Let your eyes have no rest. Chapter 3 is in the middle of the book, and that's the climax of the book. There is an interpretive question whether the man here is the author or the personified nation. In the end, it doesn't matter that much. But here you get the more positive message. The sufferer achieves patient faith in this section. Key is starting in verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to mine, and therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I have hope in him. Now these are beautiful words and often put on beautiful plaques like the one on the left. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. But we must understand that these words are not given in a beautiful setting of nature. They are given in utter catastrophe of the destruction of their capital city. Chapter 3 goes on to call on people to return to God. Verse 40, Let us examine and probe our ways, and let us return to the Lord. We lift up our heart and hands towards God in heaven. And there follows a prayer for relief from the suffering that they were experiencing. In chapter 4, it goes on to explain that the wrath was because of their sins. And it describes the siege and fall of the city, and also throws in a curse on the Edomites. Your punishment will end, daughter Zion. He will not prolong your exile. But he will punish your sin, daughter Edom, and expose your wickedness. Again, the wrath came because of their sin. 
Verse 12 in chapter 4, the kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the inhabitants of the world, that the adversary and the enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. Because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests, who have shed in their midst the blood of the righteous, they wandered blind in the streets. They were defiled with blood, so that no one could touch their garments. Chapter 5 is a communal lament and a prayer for help, and it offers some future hope for Zion. 5.1. Remember, O Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our houses to aliens. We have become orphans without a father. Our mothers are like widows. Verse 16. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. And then verse 19. You, O Lord, do rule forever. Your throne is from generation to generation. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us. Some theological reflections on Lamentations. The theological backdrop of this account is Zion theology. Some Jews held a Zion theology that thought that the promises of God precluded Jerusalem's destruction. Part of that was the election of David. God had chosen David and his kin for an eternal dynasty. You'll read about that in Psalms 2 and Psalm 89 and other Messianic Psalms, as well as 2 Samuel chapter 7. There was also the election of Mount Zion. God had chosen Mount Zion to put his holy habitation, the temple. But then... Even though those statements were true, there was a false deduction. Because of these things, neither Israel, nor the temple, nor the monarchy could ever fall. The destruction of the temple and Jerusalem was a disaster and a challenge to Zion theology. Indeed, it brought the Davidic monarchy to an end. So there was a theological crisis and a need to ask some tough questions, such as, how can God reject and abandon his own sanctuary? Is God really omnipotent? Or were the Babylonian gods just stronger than Yahweh? Or they could ask, is God unfair? Are we being punished for what others did? Lamentations 5.8 hints at that. Our fathers sinned and are no more. It is we who have borne their iniquities. We're being punished for what our ancestors have done. And if we deserve to be punished, why would God destroy us? Why should he? Will we become assimilated into Babylonian culture, those of us that have gone into exile? And how can we serve the Lord in a strange land? The Book of Lamentation gives some positive answers to some of these questions. Why was Israel destroyed? Will God in his omnipotence punish Judah? Ultimately, it was God's wrath, not Babylon or her gods, that brought wrath on Israel. Lamentations 2.1 How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud of his anger. He has hurled down the splendor of Israel from heaven to earth. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. It was God who did that as an expression of his omnipotence. 
Also chapter 2 and verse 5, the Lord is like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He is the one who treated his own sanctuary with contempt. Verse 7, the Lord has rejected his altar and abandoned his sanctuary. He has handed over to the enemy the walls of her palaces. It was God and in his omnipotence that did these things. And God was just in punishing Judah because they have sinned. Lamentations identifies the sins of the people as being the reason for God's punishment. Example 118, the Lord is righteous, for I have rebelled against his command. And chapter 339, why should any mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Let us examine and probe our ways and let us return to the Lord. God punish because they deserved it. Lamentations 2.17, the Lord has done what he purposed. He has accomplished his word, which he commanded from days of old. Or well, what is this word which he commanded from days of old? And the answer is the covenant curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28. In Deuteronomy 28, it says that if you obey the Lord, you'll be blessed. But if you disobey the Lord, you'll be cursed. And one of the curses that could come upon you for disobedience would be that you would be expelled from the land. And that's exactly what had happened to them. So the exhortation was they should obey to avoid the covenant curses. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19 summarizes this thesis after giving the blessings and curses of the previous chapters. This day I call on heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. But they chose to disobey and brought the covenant curses upon themselves, as was predicted by Moses back in Deuteronomy 28. Lamentation thus balances out the book of Job. Job tells us that suffering is not necessarily the result of sin. But lamentation tells us that sometimes it can be. Another positive answer since God is faithful to his covenant promises, in accordance with them, he will restore us. This is verse 21 of chapter 3. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. Let him give his cheek to the smiter. Let him be filled with reproach, for the Lord will not reject forever. For if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. God in the end will show grace and restore his people. This is at the heart of the message of the book, these uh, chapter 3 positive statements. And that's the thesis that we need to make the main thesis of the book of Lamentations. Again, uh, just recall that chapter 3 is the chiastic center and the central thesis of the book. Another positive answer is that God is compassionate even in his anger. The belief that God is more fundamentally compassionate than wrathful gives them hope. And after punishment comes his compassion. Verse 32, for if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. The basis of this promise 
is again the end of Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy 30 that promises return to the land and restoration after the exile. God fulfilled his promised judgment. He will likewise fulfill his promised restoration. And hence, they will not assimilate. They go to Babylonian exile, but they will return. But then you also have the value of prayer in the midst of catastrophe. Was God seemingly unfair? Instead of blaming God, the author, especially in chapter 5, offers up the unfairness to God in prayer. Now, was God even there? Much of Lamentations, God seems to be experienced by the writer as distant and inaccessible, as if no prayer could get through. As he says in 344, you have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. And yet, he continues to pray, because prayer gives hope. So how shall we conclude Lamentations? God in his sovereignty may intervene in life to punish our sins, but even then he remains compassionate, even in wrath. Even where he seems distant and uncaring, he is there, and as we seek him and confess our sins, our hope is renewed. Whatever may happen, God remains faithful to his promises and will not leave us forever in our despair. This, in part, is what we as Christians can learn from the book of Lamentations. So this is my lecture on Lamentations, and my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle.